Welcome to the Pool Guy Podcast Show. This is a special episode, episode 1500. And I want to thank all the loyal listeners who have allowed me to get this far in the podcast. I'm not planning on going anywhere at this moment, and I'm going to continue doing these podcasts. But I think this is a milestone episode, and I'm going to go ahead and recap some of the things I do in the industry as well in this podcast. Pool Service Pro, open a Leslie's Wholesale account today and receive wholesale pricing on products you use every day. Leslie's Pool Supply offers convenient locations that are open 7 days a week. Another great benefit of opening a Leslie's Wholesale account is Leslie's Referral Program. Get referred to a customer looking for weekly pool service. Save time and money and grow your pool service route and become a Leslie's Pro. I was one of the first pool podcasts out there. I started in July 9, 2017. So that's about 7 years, actually over 7 years of podcasting at this point. It was a weekly podcast at first, then I moved to a Monday through Friday podcast format shortly after that. And I've covered every every subject here from, you know, pool chemistry to equipment to reviews to using duct tape. All these things have been covered on my podcast show and many more. And I've had interviews with many people in the industry from Terry Arco, Harold Evans, of course, a span of two years with Bob Lowry coming on once a month. I was really good and I, I'm glad I got to know Bob Lowry as well as I did get to know him before he passed away a few years ago. So it's one of those things where the podcast show had a good run and I had a lot of good guests on there. I don't do as many interviews as I used to but I still do them on occasion and I think interviews are really great. I've been interviewed on other podcast shows, podcast format and with over 1500 episodes or actually 1500 episodes to date at this moment I think there's something for everyone. You can listen to the podcast by going to my website, swimmingpoollearning.com. On the banner, click on the podcast icon, and you can download the podcast there. And it's the number one podcast in the industry with over 1.7 million downloads, plus another 1.5 or 1.7 million views on YouTube. So it definitely, ha- definitely has a lot of listenership. And I'm thankful for all of you who subscribe to the podcast and tune in. I actually got my start on YouTube in March of 2012, where I put some YouTube videos up. And then it just kind of took off and got quite a lot of content on YouTube, over 1,200 videos. I have 127,000 subscribers and I have over 65 million video views. So it's definitely a channel that has taken off over the years. And I think it's one of those things where I timed it right. I was one of the first persons to have good content on YouTube and just passed everyone up pretty quickly on there. I still think I put out pretty good content on YouTube. So tune in over there to catch some of the videos, a lot of reviews, how to's. The podcast goes up once a week also on my YouTube channel. So there's a lot of content on YouTube that you can find there that will help you with your pool care and help you if you're starting out in the industry or have been in the industry for a while, especially the product reviews that I do. I think you'll find those informative and as unbiased as I can make those reviews. A little bit about me. I got started in the industry when I was 16 years old, back in 1988, and it was a family friend that trained me, and I just started doing pools for him. I think I worked one week for him, and then I just started getting my, I got a few accounts on my own. I mean, I was 16 with a couple of my own accounts, And then I got a job at a local pool store here in Upland, California, and I got out of high school and I just went to work for them. Actually, I was still in high school at 16, but I should say I got out of high school at noon and I just went to work. I was in the ROP program. Not sure if that's still around, but it was like a work program. And I went to work right from high school at 16 and continued to do pool service for the bulk of my life. And I think I really enjoy The aspects of pool service, you know, the customer service aspect, the fact that you're outside, of course, the weather is a factor in this business and it's something that you get used to, but it's never far from your mind how the weather is currently, you know, it's super hot in California the last few weeks. I enjoyed the physical exercise from pool service. I think I did a calorie count one time, how much I burn out there, especially in the summer, was somewhere like around three or 4,000 calories while you're working. It's not unheard of. You know, it's one of those things where if you want to get in shape, if you start doing this business and you're not in shape and you want to get in shape, you will get in shape because this will keep you pretty active. I like the freedom of pool service and I also like the scalability. You can really scale the business up by bringing on employees. You know, I speak a lot about 
scaling the pool service industry, scaling in the pool service industry. And I think a lot of the attractiveness of having your own business is the fact that you're making, number one, more money per hour than you would working for someone else, or you should be if you have your pricing set right. You have the freedom and the flexibility to take days off, move things around, so you don't miss events for your, with your family. And you get four weeks off during the year, which is great. You can plan this and time it, but typically you'll get two solid weeks off and then days here and there, mainly because there are calendar days where you have five Wednesdays, five Thursdays, five Fridays. And, you know, you would take those days off as an extra service day because you bill monthly and you have built in days off for that reason. It's great. I like the industry. It's really one of those insulated industries as well. So I would say that we're pretty recession proof. When I say we're insulated, things can go on in the stock market. They can go down. They can go up. You know, they can. There can be some news of recession. They can. There can be other aspects of the economy that affect other sectors. But the pool service industry is not affected so much by that. Now there are sectors that may be more affected by a recession, like pool builders, equipment sales, things like that. But the majority of the weekly service, the monthly service of pools, is not affected greatly by the ups and downs of the economy because honestly people do need pool service they need someone to clean their pool they're busy trying to pay their bills i think the cost of living has increased to a point where it's not economical for some people to do their own pools because they don't have the time to invest in it so they'd rather hire someone i know there's always talk about like the latest technology putting pool service companies out of business it was that way back in 2000 when automation started taking off you had the variable speed pumps you can you know program them and save money on energy and you can also there were some more sophisticated automated systems coming out and of course lately in the last 10 years there's a lot of phone app control systems that have hit the market all of this was supposed to put pool service companies out of business you had automation as far as the ph you know ph pumps or acid pumps and you had chlorine pumps things like that none of this has really affected the pool service industry. In fact, I would say the opposite has probably happened because of the investment in technology and the cost of building a pool has gone up tremendously to where pool service is actually something that's really affordable compared to how much you paid for your pool. Just as an example, in California, in my area, in Pasadena, San Gabriel Valley, if you wanted a pool built, and this is what any builder you call, I've seen quotes and I've compared them for people that have wanted me to look at their quote because they thought that it was too high, but for a 15 by 30 rectangular pool with a spa in there, seven foot spa, seven foot square spa, and just standard equipment, I don't even think it included automation in these bids, you're looking at $130,000 for that pool. And that's just with the coping, the standard coping with no decking around it. So that's for the equipment, pretty standard equipment, and the pool itself. So you're spending 130000 for a basic what I would consider a cookie cutter pool in my area. And that's an investment. It'd be like if you had a Ferrari or a Porsche, would you do your own oil change? Would you change your own brakes? Probably not. And the same thing goes with a pool that costs you that much money. You probably wouldn't want to take care of it and ruin that pool because it's so expensive. And so a lot of times people are paying, again, for the high cost of living and they don't have the free time in their day to do their own pool because it does take time and effort and they'd rather just pay someone to do it. And I find that this to be a real thing here in my area because I can't even give an account away sometimes when I have an account out of my area. Nobody has room on their service for it. I can't give some referrals away because everyone's booked up and that's kind of how it is in my area. It might not be the same in your area, but a lot of areas definitely have more customers at this point than there are providers in a lot of cases. So it's not super competitive here, and it's something that has been this way since COVID, basically, since we emerged out of COVID. There's been a lot of people having pool service companies do their pools. Now, if there's a downturn, you may lose some accounts. I would say 5 to 10% will try to do it themselves. But something else that's really helped the industry is that the cost of maintaining your own pool has also skyrocketed. Even if you were going to go with the BBB method of pool care and you wanted to get you know, Clorox bleach to take care of the liquid chlorine, same product actually, just different label. The price of that has gone up tremendously along with Calhypo, Trichlor tablets, Dichlor, muriatic acid. And so even the cost of doing the pool yourself is pretty high. 
And some people will just throw up their hands and say, well, I, I can't keep the pool blue. It's getting algae. I'm going to hire someone again because they're spending hundreds of dollars on chemicals to turn that pool around. And it's something that has kind of helped the industry in a way, the high inflation of the retail price of everything, forcing some homeowners to get pool service because even doing it themselves and paying for chemicals is unaffordable. And I would say that's probably the biggest change in the industry since we've emerged out of COVID. When we're going into COVID, there was an explosion of people having their pools remodeled, re, you know, built. Groundbreaking on pools was like nine months down the road because everyone was at home and they wanted to make their house, you know, beautiful, basically. You know, they had turf put in, they fixed up their house, kitchen remodel, whatever, and the pool was a component that they put in. So there was an explosion of that. Plus, there was an explosion of people actually using their backyard pools. If you've done service as long as I have, many of your customers never go into their pool. I am embarrassed to say I have a pool in my backyard. I rarely go into it now, and my son's older. And so a lot of the pools are just decorations. But during COVID, they were used like crazy. Customers that never went in their pool during COVID, they were in their pools. And so, of course, that's going to cause chemical use to go up because the pool is being used. And of course, to add fuel to the fire during that time, Biolab, they had a trichlor factory that burned down due to a hurricane hitting it, causing a fire. So trichlor tablets were, there was a shortage of trichlor tablets. They made a huge amount of trichlor tablets and they weren't making them anymore. So everyone's scrambling for chlorine. And if you remember that era where you're scrambling for toilet paper, you're also scrambling for chlorine at that time. Well, not quite at the same time, but there was a scramble for chlorine, very similar to the scramble for toilet paper. And it just became a problem in the industry where prices started skyrocketing because of the short supply. Now, the supply of chlorine is back to normal. There's plenty of tablets everywhere you go, but the prices haven't quite declined back down to prior to COVID. And I think a lot of that has to do with, of course, the higher cost of labor, the higher cost of transportation, the higher cost of insurance. Everything has gone up significantly, allowing the prices to stay elevated because there's really nowhere to cut. It's not like there's a place to cut as far as, you know, there was a shortage. Yes, we understand why the prices go up. They're down from their peaks, of course, but they're never going to probably go back down below the levels they were in 2000. 2021, 2022, because of the higher cost of all the other factors that went into that, you know, the transportation cost of the product, even the buckets that the tablets come in, there was a shortage of that, those plastic buckets. All of this adds to the fact that the inflation in the industry is here to stay. And I'm afraid to say it's one of the biggest changes in the industry. It may not be a change for the bad because a lot of pool companies like myself included, I fall in, I fell into this category where we didn't really raise our rates. We were like happy to service the pools for, you know, I it's embarrassing, but $110, $120 back in 2021, you know, even $90 and $95 because there was really no inflation. You can get four gallons of liquid chlorine from Hasta for $250. Muriatic acid was like $3 for a case. You could get 50 pounds of trichlor tablets for $80 a bucket. I mean, it was insanely inexpensive back then, not just not back in the 90s, just five years ago. So one of the things that this made us do is raise our prices to stay current with the rate of inflation, which has helped a lot of pool companies with their bottom line and made them profitable to a point where now we're actually making really good money even with the inflated cost of everything. So pool service, I'm just saying here, and I'm going to summarize this by saying pool service is a great industry. If you're thinking about jumping into it or if you have a pool service company, Stick with it. It's definitely something that's not going away. It's a growing industry. A lot of changes with technology, with different you know aspects of it. But the main core of pool service is still the same. And I support the industry a thousand percent with my podcast, with all my YouTube channels. And I really think the industry has a place for anyone that wants to jump into it. Whether you do pool service, whether you want to work for a manufacturer, if you have a product idea this industry is definitely right for you. One thing that I always try to put out there, and I, I kind of have a platform, and this is kind of my soapbox issue, is the fact that as a self-employed person, whether it's pool service, HVAC, electrical, electrician, any kind of independent business where you don't have that safety net, you don't have a company with a matching 401k, you don't have a pension like a police officer, a fireman, or a teacher, you're pretty much on your own planning your future, and one of the things that I'm really big on, and I speak of this often on my podcast, is setting yourself up 
so that you can make your money work for you later on. So you're making money now, let's say you're in your 20s or 30s, and you're making good money doing the pool service. You may even have an employee and you've scaled your business. What I mean by scale your business and what I like about pool service is that if you bring on an employee, they're doing some of the pools on your route, you're getting a portion of that income, you're paying them well, they're doing well, you're doing well, and so you've taken your business and you've increased your profit by, let's say, 40%, and you're still working the same 35 hours a week. So bringing on an employee, getting a portion of that, netting some money from the fact that they're doing some of your accounts, you've increased your income by 40%. So if you're making 10000 a month, now you're making 14000 a month, and that's all because you brought on an employee and you scaled it. So that's what I mean by scalable. It's not like you're working 80 hours a week to get that 14000 You're still working the same 35 hours and you're getting that 14000 because you just scaled your business. You can, of course, scale your business as a single polar as well. You can do things like green pool cleanups, acid washes. You can have a route that's really tight and concise, making a lot of money. And you're really scaled by working a shorter amount of hours and making more money than if you were doing a W-2 payroll type job. So there's all different ways of looking at the scalability. But the point is you're scaling your business. You are making more money than you would be the same hours working somewhere else. So what do you do with that money? Where do you put it? I like looking at it like a fork, like a pitchfork. You have three roads you can go down with the money you're making in your business. The first fork is to grow your business and make it kind of an empire. One of the persons I trained here in my area back in 1990, he has like 18 trucks. He has repairmen. He has so many accounts that when I ask him how many accounts he has, he doesn't even know how many accounts he has. He'll lose accounts sometimes. He'll cancel and they'll still continue doing the pools because they lose track of, you know, it's so big that they even lose track of who dropped out, who canceled. So the person's getting like double pool service in some cases. It's kind of funny, but if you're that big, it probably something like that would happen. So that's one fork of the road you can take. Of course, you don't need to have 18 trucks, but you can have one or two employees and grow your business and make it substantial. And maybe you can even step back and have someone manage the business while you're kind of just running things behind, like the Wizard of Oz kind of thing. So that's something that you can do. And that's some that's a good investment for your money. You're investing it into something that you know a lot about, something that's stable, which is a small business that's run correctly. You hear about businesses failing, like 80% of them fail, and that's true. They do fail, but if you're running everything correctly, that won't happen to you. So just make sure that you have a viable business and a good plan, and you're marketing yourself. So that's one fork. The middle fork would be just putting money into, you know, get a financial advisor have them find some investment funds for you, either mutual funds or something like that. But the stock market is definitely going to keep going up. It's at 40,000 points right now. And back during you know the 2008 recession, I think it was like at five or 6,000 points. So you know there's a potential for that compound money, the compound interest, you would say. But no one really makes money on interest anymore. So I'm going to say compound investments and they'll compound and grow and get bigger over the years. If you just keep investing, no matter if the market is down or up, you just keep buying and putting money in there. It's going to grow and you're going to have a pretty big portfolio in 30 or 40 years. And you're going to have probably millions of dollars in your investment funds. So that's something that you can do very easy, put 20 or 25 percent of all your extra money into there, your profit in there, and just grow those funds. I would normally say put, you know, 15% in there, but nowadays you want to put more because inflation, the, I mean, it says it's at 2%, but in reality, it's much higher and probably going to be much higher in 30 years from now. So you want to just maximize that investment. So that's the second fork. And the third fork is the one that I took, which is real estate. You can buy and hold properties, which is probably the best way to do it. I mean, you can flip, but there's a lot involved in that and you may not have the time to do that, but buying and holding. You have the appreciation of the property, you have the rental income, and if you don't do anything for 30 years, you're going to have a free and clear rental property. How many do you need? It just depends on how much rental income you need in the future. If you want to have 10000 maybe you need three of them. If you want to have 20000 maybe you need five of them. And I do have several podcasts on investing in real estate, and I go over a lot of details and aspects of it. You can pull those up, but there's a lot of great things about having rental property you get a good tax deduction from you know deducting the interest on the mortgage property tax any expenses you also get depreciation in that property so the tax breaks are 
really good. The government is kind of rewarding you for creating housing by giving you these tax breaks. So it's one of the things that you should take advantage of. You also get income sometimes immediately if, if the properties have cash flow. And then, of course, once they're paid off, you're going to have all that rent coming in. And then you have an asset that you can sell. You can't really do that if you have the money in the stocks. You can't get money immediately. I mean, sometimes, you know, they pay the shareholders 50 cents or a dollar per share. It's something that you get a check for, but it's not really the income that you would get from a rental property. And you don't have that asset that has grown over 30 years from maybe 500000 to a $1 million that you can sell and take that cash out of. So I would say, in my opinion, the third fork is the best fork because now you have passive income. Your money is making money for you. Actually, the second and third fork are probably the best for the passive income. The first fork where you build up a pool empire, you still have to manage that and you maybe you'll transfer it to someone in your family or you'll sell it off. But there's still the aspect of managing that. Where the other two, there's not quite as much involved. Of course, the middle fork, you just meet with your financial advisor and you invest in the market. And then managing the properties does take some, you know, some time, but not a huge amount. So all of these are ways that you can make sure that in the future, your money's working for yourself. And you're not out there working when you're 70. I really don't like seeing the pool pro out there when I, when I'm getting supplies and he comes in, he's like 75 years old. I'm like, I hope he's working just for fun, but probably not. Or the greeter at Walmart. You don't want to be that person. You want to have a retirement with dignity and it starts when you're young. If you're in your 20s and 30s and listening, you definitely want to start one of these forks now. And if you're older, you can still accelerate that, but it's going to be harder. You should have started earlier, but it's never too late to start, I think. You can get started at any time, and you want to have that goal in mind of making your money work for you, having your money have kind of little children, and then they make money, and that's kind of how you want to look at it. A good book for this would be the Richest Man in Babylon. It's a small book, short, but it goes over these principles in there. And I think it's a great read and pick that up. So I really appreciate everyone tuning in these last seven years for the podcast. And I really enjoy putting these out there. So I hope you enjoy the content I put out there as well. If you're looking for other podcasts I recorded, you can find those on my website, swimmingpoollearning.com. On the, on the banner, click on the podcast icon, and there'll be a drop down menu of 1500 podcasts for you there. And if you're interested in the coaching program that I offer, you can learn more at poolguycoaching.com. Thanks for listening to this podcast. Have a great week and God bless. Real quick, if you're not using pool service software, try Skimmer free for 30 days at getskimmer backslash poolguy. Again, that's getskimmer backslash poolguy. Skimmer, everything you need to run your pool service business all in one app. Pool Service Pro, open a Leslie's Wholesale account today and receive wholesale pricing on products you use every day. Leslie's Pool Supply offers convenient locations that are open 7 days a week. Another great benefit of opening a Leslie's Wholesale account is Leslie's referral program. Get referred to a customer looking for weekly pool service. Save time and money and grow your pool service route and become a Leslie's Pro.